before I read the scripture, I want to just make a comment. It's such a great crowd today. I don't know if you could see, but the parlor is full. So next Sunday, you may want to come early. Uh, we have three services, and I always like to say when we do that at other places I've been, if I weren't the preacher, I'd come to the early one and beat the Baptist to brunch <laughs> or hit the tennis court or the whatever. And now let us attend to the reading of God's holy word from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to, to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them along the road. The crowds went ahead of him, and that followed, were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil asking, who is this? And the crowds were saying, oh, well, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I want to warn you, this will be my curmudgeon sermon for the year. I may sound a little grumpy today. I have a confession to make. I've preached through Holy Week for over 40 years, and I have never really liked Palm Sunday for three reasons. And the first is it's really hard to preach. It's the hardest Sunday of all to preach. Christmas and Easter are easy. You know, you've got the C&E crowd. They know the message. They come. You know, you have to get here early to get a pew. Uh, Pentecost is fun. It's easy to preach, you know. The texts of Epiphany and Lent practically preach themselves. Uh, but Palm Sunday, it's hard. It's the hardest one of all because we have all this parade and then we have passion and how do you put all that together? Oh, there are some other difficult Sundays, to be sure, ascension. I mean, try to explain that to a modern-day space shuttle world. What, what does that mean, ascension? Or the 4th of July Sunday, you know? What preachers try to turn, when preachers try to turn church into a civil religion, or Mother's Day that can drip with sentimentality. And then there's Groundhog Day. Actually, we don't do much of that in the church year, thank goodness. But Palm Sunday is very much like this. People think they understand what it means, but we hardly ever understand what it really means. Understanding Palm Sunday is like trying to understand what a teenager means, present company excluded, of course. I read a recent survey that said, when a teenager says the word great, it can have one of three meanings. First of all, it can mean great. Second, it can mean not that again, great. Third, it can mean you have ruined my life. <laughs> the word sure can have four meanings to a teenager. It can mean, first of all, sure. It can mean second, that's what I'd expect to hear from an old person. It can mean, third, you have no idea what you're talking about. And four, you have ruined my life. <laughs> well, Palm Sunday is no different. We think we understand what it really means, but we don't. 
Oh, we love to come in with all our poems and our little poem crosses and our hosannas, you know, and we try to turn everything into a springtime version of Christmas, you know, Palm Sunday, Easter, baseball, April flowers bring May, uh, April showers bring May flowers. We know it. It's all happy. It's wonderful. But that's not what Palm Sunday means. It never has. It never will. And a part of the problem is we take this hero worship. We, we turn it into a hero parade. Oh, we love our heroes in this country, don't we? Our sports figures, our movie stars. We have our own American royalty right here. And we turn Palm Sunday into a little hero parade. It becomes a kind of pep rally for God with the children and the choirs as cheerleaders and we in the crowd. Well, it's a problem because that's not what Palm Sunday means. You see, if you try to skip the real meaning, which points to the cross and the atoning work of Christ in his suffering and his death on the city dump outside the city limits, and if you try to jump year after year directly from Palm Sunday optimism to Easter joy, then you have bought into little more than a diluted, insipid version of the real thing. That's why I don't like Palm Sunday. It's hard to preach. And that's the first reason I don't like it. The second is it's hard for Jesus, too, because people in his day didn't understand any more than we do in our day. Because of a kind of ebullient triumphalism that we even see on our religious airwaves today. Oh, back then they had their TV preachers. Oh, Peter was a TV preacher. you got to believe it. I mean, he was an E on the Myers-Briggs. He never had an unspoken thought. It was all out there. He was the chief campaign manager for Jesus' big campaign. He was organizing the disciples. They had their Jesus signs. They had their Jesus posters. He had a 1-800 number, a website. I mean, he had the whole thing. Uh, and, and he'd send your cards and letters in. Do you remember that old radio guy, Brother Al in Haywood, California? You ever heard that one? Oh, send your cards and letters, your money in to Brother Al. That's A-L, Brother Al in Haywood, California. Well, you could just see Peter doing this. And he was selling the world the religion he thought Jesus was bringing. And he figured, oh my gosh, we've been on all these whistle stops all over Galilee, and now, finally, we're going to get to go in to the Big Apple of Palestine, Jerusalem, where Jesus can really make his mark and bring in his kingdom. I just imagine Jesus must have hated Palm Sunday. Why? Because Jesus knew what was really coming. Think what Oliver Stone would have done with this story. You got Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby and people on all sides of the law, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Judases plotting what to do with this young man and his harebrained ideas. I want you to think for a moment, with all the crowds, Jesus is moving inexorably to the Texas School Book Depository. He knows exactly what's coming. And yet, he still went. He still goes through with it all. In fact, he orders his disciples to participate in the whole plan that's, that's about to happen. Go over and find that, that donkey. Oh, and there will be a cult, and they'll say, why do you want this? And you say, the Lord has need. The Lord has need of it. That's the password. Had a password. It was all part of the plan. But do you think that meant that Jesus really liked it? I don't think so. Jesus goes anyway, but he knows what's coming. How much easier it would have been to stay out in the countryside where you don't make so many waves. I mean, rural life has its own harsh realities and suburban existence has its own interpersonal problems. But when you go into the big city, when you go into the large, large city, you are forced to deal with the world at its, at its worst, with corrupt politicians, with the homeless, with the hungry, with the teeming masses trying to eke out an existence. And they were all there shouting their hosannas and waving their palm branches. And Jesus knew what he was getting himself into. 
They were all there as he entered Jerusalem, knowing what was coming. He knew that this would be the end. He knew that his odd message from God was on a collision course with the powers that be. He knew he was on his way to the bitter cup. He knew he was on his way to, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And yet, once he entered Jerusalem, he was dead within a week. And yet he still went. He still went. Years ago, one weekend, I officiated a very large wedding. Grooms won as far as the eye could see. Bridesmaids as far as the eye can see. The wedding coordinator had a headache. I had a headache. Everyone had a headache. I had gathered with the groomsmen as we did at that church way back, all crammed in together, giving them instructions. Remember to smile. This is a wedding, not a funeral. So many groomsmen just like this. Don't put your hands in your pockets and scratch, please. Don't put them behind. No fig leaf thing. I want you to put your hands to the side. Come on, guys. Are you ready? And please do not lock your knees. Whatever you do, don't lock your knees because you will surely faint. They've all nodded so young and eager, so ready to go. And we all came out and lined up like so many penguins across the front of the church. The organist was playing. We were watching the bridesmaids count. And sure enough, one of them hit the floor, boom, just like that. And we couldn't wake him up. And we hauled him to the back, dragging his heels The bride's jumping up and down at the window. What's going on? The organist keeps playing. The bridesmaids keep coming. The color drains from the groom's face. And I turned to him and I said, just keep smiling. We're not stopping now. (laughs) I think that's what Jesus probably said to the disciples. Knowing what was coming. Just keep smiling, fellas. We're not stopping now. God has a plan here, and we got to go through with it. We just got to go through with it. He said it to them, but I think he said it as much to himself. I'm going to keep smiling. I'm not stopping now because I got something I've got to do. He said it knowing that whenever there is a victory parade after a war, like let's, exam- let's say, for example, World War I, which began for America exactly 100 years ago this month right now. And when you're in that kind of victory parade, all the guys who come back, all the soldiers who come back, they're waving to the cheering crowds all along, thinking about all the buddies they lost on the battlefield and all the awful things they had to do. It was years before my dad could talk to me, even talk to me, about World War II. They're waving to the crowd. Jesus knows that every victory is at best a Pyrrhic victory. And every parade like this is at best a bittersweet parade. That's why I don't like Palm Sunday. It's more than just the misunderstanding, the the intrigue. I don't like it because it's hard to preach, and I don't like it because what Jesus has to go through. But there's a third and a final reason, that is that God surprises us in ways we never imagined. We don't really like surprises, but God does it. God surprises us by helping us understand that we just can't buy into a triumphalistic religion that's going to make everything all perfect and wonderful and the good will never die young and we'll never have anything tragic happen to us. No, our God wants us to move beyond just worshiping the baby Jesus, wants us to go from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. And that's a hard move for some of us. Jesus has to go to Jerusalem. And when he goes to Jerusalem, he is confronted with the cross. Sooner or later, you and I have to go to Jerusalem and come face to face with the the cross. And what that means for us, not just us corporately, but for you and me individually. What does it it mean, this cross? 
God surprises us in helping us understand that we have to grow up and mature in our faith. And God surprises us by helping us understand that God actually favors action over words. Oh, God uses a lot of words. There are a lot of words God says in the Bible. We see it all over the Bible. God speaks creation into existence. Let there be light. But if you look closely, you will see that the divine seems to favor action over words. Jesus taught just as much with his actions, and maybe more, than he did with his words. Sometimes he is healing someone who's contagious with leprosy, but he loved them all. Sometimes he is kneeling and washing the disciples' feet, or he's serving them bread and wine. His actions are so, so powerful. And of course, the final action is the cross, isn't it? What Palm Sunday actually points to, not just the parade. No sermon, no lesson, no book, no epistle, just divine love for you and for me. It's the way God works. God favors action over just simple words. We think we have it all figured out. We think we wrap it all up in a sermon and we wrap up the gospel in a neat package and we pass the plate and sing our hymn and we go home. That's what I thought last Sunday. I thought it was all through when I finished my sermon, but God had another plan. God decided that I had not closed the deal on that Lazarus story until God did some show and tell. And so Charlie Moss collapsed over here and Clint Kirby fell down the balcony stairs. After the first service, I was telling someone, this is my curmudgeon sermon. And they said, well, if that's your curmudgeon sermon, last Sunday was your knockout sermon. <laughs> Thankfully, both Charlie and Clint have been raised up again. As we, as we will celebrate next Sunday, the raising up of Jesus for you and for me. Now, I don't really like Palm Sunday because it makes me have to confront the cross in a way I'm not sure I really want to do. But there is something good because the God of Palm Sunday and Monday, Thursday and Good Friday and Easter is the God who loves you and me more than we could ever imagine. The one who will accept us now and forgive us of all the crazy things we've done. All the mistakes we've made in our lives. And that's the part about Palm Sunday that I really like. God bless you all.